Open up your Bibles again to 2 Kings chapter 16. We're still looking at the life of King Ahaz. This series will go on for an indefinite number of weeks. That way I will be accurate for once. 2 Kings chapter 16. You'll remember the life of King Ahaz just by way of brief review. He was a king of Judah, and he learned the ways of the kings of Israel up there, the northern tribes. And you remember they were idolaters, and he learned some really nasty habits from them, like uh, burning his children in the fire to Molech, sacrificing in high places, under green trees, idolatry, uh, a whole bunch of very sinful things. And the Lord was quite... Uh, upset with this, as you can imagine. And in Second Kings 16 and verse 5, we see the result of that, which is what we began to look at last Sunday. It says, Then Reason, king of Syria, and Pekah, son of Remaliah, king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to war, and they besieged Ahaz, but could not overcome him. I had intended to get the whole way through this verse last time, but I didn't, and I hope to get through it this Sunday. I should be able to. So that took us over to Second Chronicles chapter 28, which is the parallel text. So what happened was, was whenever Ahaz learned the ways of Israel, the Lord finally had enough of that, and he sent in Israel and another nation, the, the Syrians, to punish Ahaz for that. And we can see that, as I mentioned last Sunday, in Second Chronicles 28 and verse 5, where it opens up with the word, Wherefore? Wherefore the Lord his God delivered him into the hand of the king of Syria, and they smote him with, uh, and they smote him and carried away a great multitude of them captives and brought them to Damascus, and he was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel, who smote him with a great slaughter. And that word wherefore means as a result of. So he was judged by these two foreign nations. United Nations, if you will, against the Church of God. See, there's nothing new uh, under the sun, right? Here's United Nations, and there's other examples of that back in, uh, in different places in the Bible. I could probably find you one here. This is totally off the top of my head. I think it's in the book of, of Joshua. I'm just going to go back here and look for it quickly, and if I don't find it, I'll move on. But there have been numerous times throughout history where the nations would gather together against the Lord's people. So the idea of a united nations is, uh, is really nothing new that, that Satan might use to punish us. Here's an example of it in Joshua chapter 9. It says, And it came to pass, when all the kings that were on this side Jordan, in the hills, and in the valleys, and in the coasts of the great sea, over against Lebanon, the Hittite, and the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite heard thereof that they gathered themselves together to fight with Joshua and with Israel with one accord. So here are united nations, a bunch of nations against God's people. Um, so it should come as no surprise to us that Satan has been trying to gather the nations together and for the purpose of persecuting God's people. And this has been happening for over 100 years now, at least, with the League of Nations. That started after World War I, and then the United Nations after World War II. The Bible's always up to date. So anyway, uh, last time we looked at how the Lord used both of these nations to judge Israel, and these nations would represent both unbelievers, like heathen out there, which were the Syrians. They were just uh, you know, stump-worshipping idolaters. They had no dealings with God. And then also apostate churches, because that's what the nation of Israel was by this time. King Jeroboam had led them into apostasy and had them worshiping golden calves and Dan and Bethel and, and making up his religion as he went. And so they, were, they had apostatized, and God uses an apostate church and the heathen both uh, to punish his church, as we saw last time. And then we saw that the judgment was, was very severe. Uh, Pekah, the son of Remaliah, there in verse 6, slew in Judah 120,000 valiant men that day because they'd forsaken the Lord. And we looked at that of when you forsake the Lord, the Lord then sends judgment. 
and this would have been severe, 120,000. But then we saw, and this is what I left off with last time, that the judgment not only came in the aggregate. It didn't, it didn't only come in such a large presentation of God's judgment where you could see where hundreds of thousands of people were killed, but it also got really close to Ahaz as well, where his own son was killed there in verse 6. His son, um, Maasiah. And then also the governor of the house, and presumably uh, the king's house, and Elkanah that was next to the king. So the governor of his own house and his own right-hand man. So people really close to him were also uh, slain because of his sins. This is what God does sometimes to get people's attention, is that he brings the judgment nice and close. And then that, that's where we left off. Uh, last time, and that brings us down to verse 8, Second Chronicles 28 and verse 8. It says, And the children of Israel carried away captive of their brethren 200,000 women, sons, and daughters, and took also away much spoil from them, and brought the spoil to Samaria. So not only do 120,000 valiant men get killed, but then they carry captive 200,000 women and children, essentially, as slaves into a foreign land. They take them up to Samaria. And, you know, we read over things like this, and we probably don't give it much thought. But just imagine if a foreign nation came here, if the Canadians came down, they got mad at us for, for making fun of them for their ice hockey or something like that, and they come down here and carry away captive 200,000 women and children and take them up there to become you know, slaves to sled dog runners or something like that. You can just imagine, I'm just making fun of the Canadians again, but anyway, you can imagine what that would be like, all joking aside though, is to be carried away captive, to, to be taken from your home and then it says they spoiled them. So not only were they taken from their homes, but then their homes get ransacked and all of their stuff, all of their money, all of their goods, everything that they have, all their clothing gets taken to a foreign nation. That's God's punishment for sin. I mean, that's some serious judgment right there. And this is what happens. God's people are delivered into captivity for their sin. Look at Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 5. In verse 13, Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 13. It says, therefore, actually, let me, let, me, let me back up. Let's back up to verse 11. It says, woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink and continue until night, till wine inflame them. We got people that do that in this country, Right? Alcoholics, people who drink way too much. They go out to the bars and they drink until wine inflame them. And the harp, and the vial, and the tabret, and pipe, and wine are in their feasts, but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. So here we have drugs and concerts, right? American culture, in other words. American culture since the 1960s. Drinking way too much and enjoying way too much music. Worldly, ungodly music. And what is the result of behavior like that? They regard not the work of the Lord, nor consider the operation of his hands. You have a people, and it's interesting, at the same time in this country's history, when they got into drugs and rock and roll, and what else did they get into? Abandoning God. God gets out of the schools. God gets out of public life. God is not allowed to be mentioned in respectable conversation anymore. It's almost like when somebody mentions the name of God, especially the name of Jesus Christ, in public, it's like, oh, hey, what do you, you can't say that. They regard not the work of the Lord, nor the operation of his hands. And what happens to people like that? Verse 13, Therefore my people are gone into captivity, because they have no knowledge, and their honorable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst. There's the punishment. Captivity. This is what happened to King Ahaz in Judah. Now, it's not really a far stretch after having just lived through 2020 to see what can happen when people turn their backs on the Lord and get delivered to captivity. We literally were in captivity last year. 
I mean, when you have the government telling you you cannot leave your house only for certain reasons, you are a prisoner, you are a slave, you are in captivity. We were literally in captivity. Right? Am I right? We're in captivity, right? Just making sure I'm, we're on the same page here. And if you could manage to get out of your house, there wasn't a whole lot to do because they'd forcibly shut down all the businesses. Right? This is what happens. People are famished. Right? Their honorable men are famished, and the multitude dried up for thirst. And what happened last year? We went into captivity. They shut down a lot of the economy, and people were famished. People you know, were in desperate straits and still are. This is what happens when you turn your back on the Lord. This happened to Israel at different times, several different times in its history, to significant times that it happened was when the Babylonians came, and this wasn't too long after King Ahaz, just within a, you know, few, a few kings after him. Uh, the, the Lord finally had enough and sent the Babylonians in and carried Israel into captivity for 70 years. And then, uh, hundreds of years, many hundreds, 500 or so years later, then the Lord sent in the Romans whenever he had finally had enough, when Israel had finally filled up its cup of iniquity. If you turn there to, to uh, Luke chapter 21, Luke chapter 21 and verse 24. This is what happened to Israel again. I mean, so here you've you got three times just in this study that we're looking at. you got Ahaz, and then you got with the Babylonians, and, and now you have uh, with the Romans. It says, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. They were led away captive. And this time they never came back. I mean, they, you know, some people claiming to be Jews came back. But even if you consider those people that are claiming to be Jews, even if you consider them Jews coming back to their land, which you know, I, don't, I don't necessarily buy, but even if you, can, even if you, if you give that to them, it was almost 2,000 years that they and their children and generations afterwards were captive in foreign lands in Eastern Europe and Russia and all kinds of different places. This is the punishment for sin. I mentioned this last time, but this is another example of how God uses the very people that you follow, that you go after and follow their sin. He uses those people to judge you for your sin. And this is another example. The children of Israel carried away captive of their brethren, 200,000 women, sons and daughters, and took them away and much spoil with them and brought the spoil to Samaria. So if you go either physically or spiritually in your heart to Samaria, right? That was the capital of Israel. If you go to a foreign place, even spiritually, and you do as the foreign nation does or as the foreign religion does, Right? then you will be judged by that place. And it's kind of interesting that Ahaz wanted to go, he wanted to follow Israel and Samaria. So the Lord says, okay, you like Samaria so much? I'll give you a little trip to Samaria. You can go up there and be a captive in Samaria. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, look at Deuteronomy 7 and verse 16. I'll just give you some examples of this. These are different ones than I gave you last time. Deuteronomy 7 and verse 16. It says, And thou shalt consume all the people which the Lord thy God shall deliver thee. Thine eye shall have no pity upon them, neither shalt thou serve their gods, for that, for that will be a snare unto thee. Now, a snare is like being in captivity, right? A snare is a trap. If you get caught in a snare, what are you? You're captive, right? So, the Lord is telling them here, you destroy these other nations and don't serve their gods because if you do, they will be a snare to you. In other words, you are going to go into captivity if you follow these other nations. And this is the fulfillment of it, one of the many fulfillments of it in Israel's history. This happened to them numerous times. Uh, look at Psalm 106, 35 through 36. Psalm 106, 
35 through 36. Let's start with verse 34. They did not destroy the nations concerning whom the Lord commanded them, but were mingled among the heathen and learned their works. And they served their idols, which were a snare unto them. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils. Their idols were a snare. Their idols brought them into captivity. Because religion, false religion, is captivity. It's captivity of the mind and of the soul. Right? You don't have the peace and the strength that you once had from the Lord. You don't have the truth which makes you free. Remember what Jesus said, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That's the opposite of captivity. That's being released from captivity. When you don't follow the truth, and you abandon the truth, what do you end up being? Unfree. What is that? It's being in captivity. See, instead of being delivered into captivity, what we need to do is we need to take into captivity all of our wayward thoughts. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3. It says, For though we war in the flesh, we do, I'm sorry, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, I'm at 2 Corinthians 10, 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and exalt and everything, every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. If you don't want to be brought into captivity, spiritual or otherwise, bring your thoughts into captivity. Take those thoughts, take those ungodly, sinful thoughts, those thoughts that are against the things of God, opposed to God, whatever they might be, and there's tons of them, thoughts of evolution, thoughts of feminism, right? thoughts of socialism, you name it. Whatever those thoughts are that we have that are opposed to the order that God has set up for us, you bring those thoughts into captivity. You put those things in a cage and don't let them get out. And when you do that, you won't be delivered into captivity. Turn with me to Proverbs 29 and verse 6. Proverbs 29 and verse 6. You think about some of the evil doctrines that are out there that have brought people into captivity. I'm reading a book right now called Total Truth by Nancy Piercy, and she's talking, it's about Christian worldview. And she is, among other things, making the case about how Darwinian evolution has really corrupted the minds of Christians and brought Christians into captivity. And it has. If, if you can be convinced, and most people have, that we evolved from molecules which turned into amino acids, which turned into proteins, which turned into you know, goo and, and ends up turning into you. If you can believe that story and believe that we really came from pond scum and that's all we are is evolved pond scum, then you're in captivity because you have no need for a God whatsoever. And if you are nothing but pond scum and if everything that you are has evolved and come about from evolution, that also means that your morality has come through evolution and natural selection. And that's what they, that's what evolutionary psychologists have been promoting for a long time now. That it's not only our physical persons that have come about through evolution, but it's all of our, it's our psychology, it's our morality, it's our thoughts, our actions, it's our, you know, Whatever, whatever we ha- whatever is, is in us, whatever we think and do, it all is a product of evolution. In other words, there's no meaning, there's no purpose. Nobody was created for anything. You're just here by chance. And if you're here by chance and you got here because you made 
collectively, you know, previous generations made choices based on selfishness and the fittest survive, well, then what does that tell you? What, what kind of morality is acceptable? What kind of morality got us to where we are today? Selfishness, survival of the fittest. You see how this, is, this has brought a, an entire generations into captivity, into bondage. Called into question the word of God, and people don't believe it anymore now because they have an alternate explanation for how we got here. Look at Proverbs anyway. Proverbs 29 and verse 6 says, In the transgression of an evil man there is a snare. In other words, he's going to bring himself or others into captivity. But the righteous doth sing and rejoice. So you transgress, you get snared. If you don't, well, you'll sing and rejoice. You have peace. It's always best to do what the Lord says. Turn with me to 2 Timothy 2 and verse 26. This is my job to help people to recover themselves from the snare of the devil, from captivity, in other words. They're brought into captivity by false doctrine, by false ideas, by deception and delusion. And they need three things. It says in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 24, it says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, in, pa- in meekness, in, uh, apt to teach patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure, which means he might or he might not, perchance, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they might recover themselves out of the snare, the captivity, of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. You see, any time the devil gets you to believe a lie, whatever that lie might be, you are now in captivity to the extent that that lie keeps you in captivity. And the more lies you believe, the more captive you become. I mean, think about it. I hate to keep going back to the COVID thing, but you know, I can't help myself. If you can convince a population that this disease that you know, kills like 0.1% of the population. And if you're young, it pretty much kills just about nobody. If you can convince a population that they are in, in severe danger and that their lives are at stake here, and if they don't wear the mask and if they don't social distance and if they don't, you know, follow all the, the protocols of the people with the clipboards and white suits and all that, if they don't do that, then, I mean, this is going to be mayhem. Millions of people, that's what they told us in the beginning, millions of people are going to die. Right? If you can convince them of this lie, then what have you done? Brought them into captivity. Even when the lockdowns are lifted, even when the restaurants get opened again, these people won't even go out anyway. They won't go back because they are so afraid. They are captives in their own mind because of lies that they have believed. You think about that. It is the snare of the devil. How many Christians out there, so-called anyway, still won't go back to church? There's a ton of of so-called Christians out there that still won't go back to church almost a year later because they are in captivity. They are in the snare of the devil, afraid of a disease that relatively kills very few. I know people die of it. I get that. I'm not saying that people don't. But I'm relatively speaking here. When there's a survival rate of 99.9%, That's not very many people when you consider the whole population. They're in captivity. You know what they need? They need a preacher or they at least need somebody with some sense to tell them some of the facts about this thing. And they need God to give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, if he will. And then they need to recover themselves from the snare of the devil, taken captive at his will. Now that's just one example. Right? Of course, this passage is primarily referring to spiritual things. But you know what? This COVID thing fits to a T right there. Taken captive. And until they're willing to open up their eyes and realize they've been lied to and to put away the fear, they're going to be in captivity. And unfortunately, we have to live with these people. And they happen to be the majority. 
and they're making us be in captivity because of their fear. So, I hope and pray that they have their minds open to the truth so that maybe we can get back to somewhat of a semblance of normal life. But anyway, let me give you one more. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 6. Second Timothy three and verse six. Even if it was a disease that killed lots of people, and even if you had a significant chance of dying from it, who wants to live as a slave? Who wants to live in prison? Really? You know, I mean this sounds cliche. Give me liberty or give me death. I'd much rather die of COVID than be a a, a slave and a prisoner in my own mind, and and physically for that matter. Wow. That's the difference between the founding generation and this pathetic one. The founding generation said, give me liberty or give me death. This one says, give me safety at all costs. And a stimulus check, and then I'm I'm good. 2 Timothy 3. In verse 6, it says, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. Who are Who is most easily led captive? It's people that are laden with sins and led away with diverse lusts. You take a person that has all kinds of sins, they're already compromised, and they're led away with diverse lusts, where... They want certain things. And pretty much you take a person that has this, this, this vehement desire to have things, whatever the thing might be. It could be a physical thing. It could be a family thing. It could be any, a career thing. It could be any kind of thing. You take somebody that has this deep desire to have this thing that they want, and that is a person that is so easy to take into captivity because they'll give up anything to get that thing that they want. Those are the kinds that are led into captivity. So back there in 2 Chronicles 28 and verse 8, they were carried away captive and they took away much spoil from them and brought the spoil to Samaria. You know, the Bible says that riches make themselves wings and fly away as an eagle toward heaven to trust not in uncertain riches and... There's an example of it. Things were going along just fine, and all of a sudden, Israel shows up. Syria shows up. And then everything you worked for is gone. Right? It can, it, it can depart just like that, in the snap of a finger, in an instant. So you want to hold on to the things of this life with a loose grip, because they can disappear, whatever they are. Now let's get down to verse 9. Now something changes. You notice verse 9 opens up with a but. But a prophet of the Lord was there whose name was Oded. And he went out before the host that came to Syria, host as an army, and said unto them, Behold, because the Lord God of your fathers was wroth with Judah, he hath delivered them into your hand, and ye have slain them in a rage that reacheth up unto heaven." So, I want you to notice something here of what the prophet tells them. He acknowledges that what they did was at the hand of God. That God had delivered Judah into their hand. Right? They were a wicked nation. And yet, God used that wicked nation to punish Judah. He had delivered them into their hand. And then, they really went with it. Right? He delivered them into their hand, and boy, they, they just massacred they slew people in a rage that reached up to heaven. I mean, they, they, they took a little too far. What's happening here is things are about ready, things are going to turn. Because Judah had been in, in very desperate straits. 120,000 killed, 200 carried away captive, spoil taken to a, a foreign land. Things are looking really bleak here. And then a prophet of the Lord comes along and he rebukes the nation of Israel that had taken them captive. And this is something that will give us some hope. I realize that th- these sermons have, have been pretty dark and dreary because, I mean, well, what are you going to do? I mean, look at the subject material here. Look at the chapter. There's 
there's not a whole lot of uh, flowery, happy talk that I can give you here, uh, given the, the subject matter. But here's a bit of a silver lining in the cloud. You see, this shows us that God will have mercy on people, if they, on his people, if they repent. Now, in this case, I'm not even sure. I, maybe, it, maybe it happened and it wasn't stated, but it does not say they repented. It just says that the Lord sent a prophet there and told them, hey, back off. Free them. And, but if God will free people who don't repent, how much more will he do so to people that do? Let me give you an example of this. Deuteronomy 30, 1 through 3. Deuteronomy 30, 1 through 3. Now, I'll give you an example of God just having outright mercy on people that had no claim to it whatsoever. But before I do that, I want to show you that if you want to count on the mercy of God, if you want to count on being delivered, it's by repentance. It's by confession of sin. It's not just by saying, well, you know, Lord, the Lord's just merciful and I'm, I'm just going to continue doing what I've always done and he'll probably deliver me because after all, that's what he did to Ahaz. Well, he can do that, but that doesn't mean that he always will. Let me show you an example here. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 3. It says, It shall come to pass, when all these things are come upon thee, and these are, are all of the curses that the Lord had pronounced on the nation, when he told them that if, if you do well, you're going to be blessed. And he goes on and he, he spends a chapter or maybe a half a chapter, I can't remember, saying about all the blessings that are going to come to Israel. And they're going to be blessed and they're going to be rich and they're going to be the head and their enemies are going to be the tail and they're going to... Right, they're going to be wealthy and prosperous and everything is going to go wonderfully for them. But then he turns around and he says, if you disobey, then all these bad things are going to come on thee and overtake thee. And he lists off all these terrible things. And one of those terrible things was they were going to be carried captive into foreign lands. And then here's what he says in verse 30. And it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among the nations whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee. So they're going to think about that. They're going to be in captivity in a foreign nation or nations, and they're going to remember, oh, yeah, I remember the Lord told us that, that if we obeyed, things were going to go well. If we disobeyed, things were going to go very badly. So badly we end up eating our own children. And that's one of the things that he said there that would happen. They're going to remember these things whenever they are in the place where the Lord hath driven them. In verse 2, And shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day. Thou and thy children, with all thine heart and with all thy soul. So this is true repentance. They return unto the Lord with all their heart, with all their soul. This is not and I'm sorry I got caught type of thing. This is, I have sinned. I have, I'm totally and completely wrong. And Lord, I am devoting my life to thee. I am turning this around with my whole heart and my whole soul, mind, body, and spirit. I am going to serve thee now. If the people do that, whenever they're carried away in a captive land, here's what happens. Verse 3 that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. So that's what you do. I hope we never get in that physical condition. We could get in that spiritual condition. Any one of us could. We could get into captivity. Believers have. I've, I've known of lots of them. Right? Some of them have... Uh, been excluded from the church and been given over to delusion and believing a lie and being in captivity to false doctrine, to heresy. I've seen that happen. And you know what? The same thing will is true. If you're in that condition and you turn unto the Lord and you repent, He will deliver you from the captivity, the doctrinal, spiritual captivity. I hope it doesn't ever happen to us physically, but if it did, and we did get ransacked by another nation, well, you know what the thing to do is? Deuteronomy 30, 1 through 3, that's what you do. You turn back to the Lord and see if He doesn't deliver the captivity. 
It's better, though, to do it beforehand. Better to do it before you're in captivity than after. Turn with me to 2 Chronicles 7 and verse 14. <clears throat> I'll show you what the hope for this nation is, what could be the hope of this nation. Honestly, I don't hold out much hope for it at all. I just I, I see the, the people of this nation and how they live and how they think. I don't have much hope that this is going to happen, but if it would happen, I know the Lord would turn this thing around in a heartbeat. Second Chronicles 7 and verse 14 says, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn, their, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now mine eyes shall be open and mine ears attent unto the prayer that is made in this place. You know what this place is? It was the temple. It was the newly constructed temple. That, was, that had just been um, dedicated. Solomon says, God's ears are open specifically to the prayers that are made in this place. That's why it's so important to come to church. And when you come to church, it's a good idea to pray. We pray corporately, but it's a good idea to pray to yourself too. Pray before the service. Pray when we're here. Because God specifically hears prayers that are made in this place. And we're not like other churches where I take prayer requests from the congregation. I don't know. Some of you have probably grown up in, in mainline churches like I have, and we don't do that. I always I thought that was kind of weird the first time I went to the Cincinnati church as a visitor that they didn't take prayer requests. Um, but what happened in the church that I grew up in anyway is it was probably 75% women, and women aren't supposed to be speaking in the church anyway, so they shouldn't be doing that. But the point is, if you want me to pray for something publicly, then tell me. Tell me about it before the service. And, you know, assuming it's something that I would pray for publicly and it's, you know, you're not asking for something crazy, then yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to do that because God hears the prayers that are made in this place specifically. But he says there, if they will turn to turn from their wicked ways and seek his face and pray, he will hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. He says, my people which are called by my name. <clears throat> Now, in Israel's day, that was referring to the nation. In our day, that's referring to the churches within the nation. My people that are called by my name. But, you know, it still holds true. He will heal our land. He's not going to hear the prayers of the heathen out there and all the, the pseudo-Christians, and all the, but he'll hear our prayers. And if he hears our prayers, he'll heal, heal our land. You realize that Sodom and Gomorrah would have been spared for 10 righteous people. And that was, I don't know how many thousands of people were in that city, but I'm sure there were thousands. 10 people God would have spared the city for. God says, if my people will humble themselves, turn to me, seek my face, pray I'll heal their land. So keep praying. I don't have a whole, <clears throat> a whole lot of... Uh, High expectation for the rest of the people of this country, but if God's churches do so, maybe God will stay the judgment. All right, turn back to Second Chronicles, chapter twenty-eight. Second Chronicles, chapter twenty-eight. So here the prophet is sent, and the Lord decides to turn back the captivity by telling the prophet to tell the king and the people, you guys have gone too far. Turn this thing around. And you know, sometimes God will do that just for the sake of his people, just because of his love and mercy, even when they don't deserve it. And I'll just give you an example of this. This would be <clears throat> in a more of an eternal example, I guess you could call it, for lack of a better term. But in, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 6, let me just give you one example, which everybody will agree with, that sometimes, even when we're not seeking the Lord's face, the Lord will be merciful upon his people anyway. <clears throat> Romans 5, 6 through 10. It says, for when, when we, uh, for when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. 
But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. When God saved us from our sins, it wasn't because we were turning and seeking his face and praying. We were dead in sins. Christ did that out of his sheer grace and mercy alone because he chose to love us. Because we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, given to Jesus Christ to die for. And Christ came and died for his enemies. And basically, it looks like that's about what happened back here in Second Chronicles 28 with King Ahaz. Ahaz was a wicked man. He was an enemy of God. Judah had been led by him into all manner of sin, all manner of wickedness. And God just looks down in mercy and delivers them anyway. Sometimes God does that. And we ought to thank him for it and praise him for it. And here's just another thought <clears throat> there on verse 9 and the verses that follow, is that sometimes God can turn a very desperate situation, he can turn things around very quickly that seem totally hopeless. Because if you think about it, if you put yourself in the position here of King Ahaz and of Judah, here you are, two nations come against you, and Israel, your northern neighbors, kill 120,000 of your valiant men, carry away captive 200,000 people. Things are really bad. And I mean, if I was Ahaz at that point, I wouldn't be thinking, deliverance is right around the corner. Would you? I'd be thinking, boy, this is bad. It's going to get a lot worse. We we are really, we've been really diminished now. We are in a really weak spot. They're probably going to take the whole nation. It is over. We're done. And the Lord turned it around just like that. He sent a prophet to their captors and told them, you guys back off. You think about that. He turned it around in a heartbeat. I just give you one example of this. Let's go back to uh, 2 Kings chapter 6, I think it is. 2 Kings chapter 6. It says, and it came to pass, this is uh, verse 24, 2 Kings 6, 24. And it came to pass after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his host and went up and besieged Samaria. This wasn't the first time that um, the king of Syria had been against Israel and Judah, Israel in this case. <clears throat> and there was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for four score pieces of silver and the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. Let me tell you what. If I had worked hard and saved up 80 pieces of silver, which is, you know, this is not a fortune or anything, but that's some money anyway. If I had 80 pieces of silver, you know, what's that? That's maybe, a, I don't know. Let's just say, you know, between... $1,500, $2,000, something like that, depending on how big the pieces of silver were and all that. But anyway, if I had some money saved up like that, you know, a decent amount, a little bit of money I could do something with, and things got that bad that I had to spend all that on an ass's head, I think I'd just say, you know what, I'm just going to starve. I mean, there's no sense in wasting my money on an ass's head, and certainly not on a cab of dove's dung. You know what, I'll just forget about it. But maybe, maybe I would change my mind if I was hungry enough. I don't know. But anyway, the point is, that things were really bad. I mean, if you are in an economy that is bad enough that you would be willing to give 80 pieces of silver for an ass's head, that you can make some head cheese out of maybe, or something, things are bad. And you know how long it took that economy to turn around? 24 hours. One day, the Lord turned the whole thing around, and whenever it got turned around, A measure of fine flour sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley sold for a shekel, just like the Lord said would happen. So anyway, just to, you know, in the midst of the gloom and doom, just give you something to hope for, too, that God can turn things around very quickly. Now, maybe he won't turn it around for the whole nation, but maybe he will turn it around for us as individuals, or us as a church, or maybe he will somehow protect us. You think, how could God protect us in the middle of a country like this that's under judgment? That's just a stupid statement. That's just stupid to even think about. 
How could God? If you ever say, how could God, you are an idiot. Unless you're saying, how could God lie or how could God deny himself? Okay, I'll, I'll give you that. But if anything else, you say, how could God? Just stop yourself right there. God can do anything. With God, all things are possible, we're told in the scripture. He can turn things around in a heartbeat if he wants to. Now down to verse 10. It says, And now ye purpose to keep under the children of Judah and Jerusalem for bondmen and bondwomen unto you. But are there not with you, even with you, sins against the Lord your God? I want to make one little point, and this is this would be kind of a side point, but it's it's interesting. There's that phrase there, they purpose to keep under the children of Judah in Jerusalem for bondmen. And I had a note there from a long time ago for 1 Corinthians 9.27 because this verse explains something that Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9.27. And if you didn't know what Paul was talking about, if you just compare it with this verse, you will. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 27. Paul said, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. He kept under his body. Well, he kind of tells you what it means there. Bring it into subjection. And you see what it says here. Ye keep under the children of Judah for bondmen and bondwomen. Right? So when you keep under somebody, you bring them into bondage, into subjection. Right? You make them your slave, your servant. And Paul was saying here, he kept under his body. He brought his body into subjection like a slave to him. He was not going to let his body and his flesh and its lust rule and control him. He was going to put it under. He was going to be in control of it. The spirit lusteth against the flesh and the, and the flesh against the spirit. And these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do that which you would. That's in Galatians chapter 5. There's this fight going on. But what Paul did was with his spirit kept under his body, kept that thing under control. Because if he didn't, he would be a castaway. When he preached to others, if he let his flesh get the best of him and followed the lust of his flesh and committed any one of the number of dozens of sins in the Bible that are excludable offenses, guess what? He's a castaway. He's done. His ministry is over. He has to keep under his body. So do I as a preacher. We all do if we want to stay in the church, but especially preachers, because this is what Paul's referring to. When I have preached to other, I my, others, I myself should be a castaway. Very important. And if a preacher doesn't do that, doesn't keep under his body, and he commits some sin, like, I don't know, maybe adultery, he's out. He's out. Period. He's a castaway. He's done. Jonathan Crosby has no, no, he has no business being in the ministry because he didn't keep under his body and bring it into subjection. He's a castaway. So the prophet here tells them, Second Chronicles 28 and verse 10 again, the prophet tells them that they are keeping under Judah and, and Jerusalem as bondmen, but he says, wait a minute, you guys got some sins of your own here. I mean, you're, you're quick to um, judge somebody else. You know, you're quick to bring them under, but have you brought yourselves under? In other words, you know what he's saying? He's basically saying what Jesus said to the men that brought the woman caught in adultery to him. John chapter 8, John chapter 8, and verse 7. Remember what he said to her? John chapter 8 and verse 7. So, so when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. He didn't say it to her, pardon me. He said it to them. He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. This is essentially what the prophet was telling the people of Israel. Oh yeah, you're keeping under Judah, but you've got some of your own sins here. You want to start casting stones, you better make sure that you are guiltless. Now, of course, it doesn't mean that you have to be sinless to start casting stones. None of us are sinless. But if you're guilty of the very thing that you're throwing a stone at somebody for, you're going to be in trouble. And this is what 
was going to happen to Israel. They're going to be in trouble. They got sins of their own. Look at Romans chapter 2. I wonder, turn to Romans chapter 2 and verse 1. I wonder, with that woman caught in adultery in the very act, of course they didn't bring the guy along, so that's why Jesus wasn't going to condemn her, because it was the adulteress and the adulterer were to be put to death. But I wonder if this wasn't her first rodeo, and if some of the very guys that were accusing her might have been involved with her. Because they threw down the stones and walked away. Think about that. Romans chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. You can't judge somebody for the th- if you're doing the same thing. He gives some examples of that in verse 21. Thou therefore that teachest another, teachest thou not thyself. Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? if you're a thief, you can't be condemning thieves. Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? And if you're an idolater, you can't condemn other people for idolatry. If you're a fornicator, you can't condemn other people for fornication. You've got to clean up yourself first. You've got to take the beam out of your own eye in order to be able to see clearly, to take the moat out of the brother's eye. Look at Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. This is basically verses 1 through 5. This is what the prophet is telling Israel, in other words. Even with you, there are sins against the Lord your God. What are you doing being so harsh on Judah? Matthew chapter 7, 1 through 5. It says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Now, most people only read the first verse of this passage. Judge not that you be not judged. You've probably heard people say that a million times. Have you ever had that? Have you ever been condemning something, some wickedness, and somebody says, judge not? They usually say, judge not lest you be judged. I don't know what version they're reading. But they usually say, they don't even read the whole Usually they don't even read the whole sentence. They read the first two words. Judge not. After all, Jesus said judge not. You cannot judge as a Christian. Jesus said judge not. Keep reading. Number one, as soon as you say that, you are a hypocrite. As soon as you tell somebody judge not, you are a hypocrite. You know that? If that's all you say to them, judge not, you're a hypocrite. You know why? You're judging them. You are judging them for judging. You're a hypocrite. Now, if you uh, use the rest of the passage and you say, judge not hypocritically, then you're not a hypocrite, right? This is what Jesus is getting at here. Take the beam out of your own eye before you take the mote out of a brother's. When you take the beam out of your own eye, you're judging yourself. So, you know, if you are, let's just use an example. Maybe you are having an, affair, an adulterous affair with three different women at the same time. And then you find out a co-worker is uh, looking at soft porn on the internet. And you say, look, you wicked, lascivious sinner. What do you think you're doing looking at Sports, Ill- Sports Illustrated uh, swimsuit edition? That's an example. You've got a beam in your eye. Go end the adultery, right? Get your act cleaned up. And then start talking about the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition, right? That's an example. But once you get the beam out of your own eye, then you can take the mote out of your brother's eye. You know what that is? It's judging. You're judging your brother, but you've judged yourself first. Then you can help out the brother. 
That's what Jesus is condemning, hypocritical judgment. But anyway, the point is, back here in Second Chronicles 28, is that he's telling them, hey, you guys have a beam in your own eye. You have sinned against the Lord your God yourself. I mean, after all, where do you think Judah learned all their sin that they're now being judged for by you? They learned it from you guys. You're not exactly perfect angels here. This is what he's telling them. You see, the Lord will reprove kings for his people's sake. And this is what is happening here. Let's look at Psalm 105, 14 through 15. Psalm 105, 14 through 15. Love this passage. This gives me a lot of comfort. Psalm 105, 14 says, He suffered no man to do them wrong. Yea, he reproved kings for their sakes, saying, Touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm. You see, the Lord, when his people were with him and were doing right, the Lord reproved kings for his sake, for their sakes. He told them, You don't touch my prophets, you don't touch my kings, you don't touch my people. You see, if we're on the side of the Lord, the Lord will fight for us. If we're with him, and he'll protect us, he'll put that barrier of protection, he'll put that wall around us, and we won't have to worry about what our enemies can do to us if we're with him. Verse 11, 2 Chronicles twenty-eight eleven it says, Now hear me therefore, and deliver the captives again, which ye have taken captive of your brethren, for the fierce wrath of the Lord is upon you. You guys are in trouble, in other words. The Lord has used you to punish them, but now the Lord is turning that wrath against you. Now he's had enough of you, and now the rod's going to turn back. So you better lighten up. And this is what God does. God uses wicked people to punish his people, and whenever he has accomplished the punishment, he punishes the wicked people that he used to punish his people. Look at Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 5. Isaiah 10 and verse 5. Now what usually happens is the people that, are, that God is using to judge his people, they don't know that they are being used by God. All they think is, wow, man, we are, we are kicking the snot out of these people. We brought them into subjection. We've killed 120,000 of them. We've taken 200,000 slaves. We got all the spoil. Man, I mean, we're great. I mean, this is like, this is Israeli exceptionism, exceptionalism here, right? We're, we're God's chosen people. God is on our side. They don't know that God is just using them as a tool in his hand. It was that way with the king of Assyria. Isaiah 10 and verse 5, O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger, and the, staff in, uh, and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. You see, whenever they had that staff that they were smiting people with, that was God's indignation. God was using that staff to smite wicked people, and other, in this case, his own people. I will send him against an hypocritical nation, and against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil, and to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. This is exactly what happened to Judah, precisely. Howbeit he meaneth not so, neither doth his heart think so, but it is in his heart to destroy and cut off nations, not a few. He doesn't know that the Lord's given him this power. He's just out there having a good time. Just like all of the... You know, all of the um, imperialistic nations, you know, they just go out there and conquer one after another. Probably like the U.S., right? The, U- the, the Lord has used the U.S. to punish a lot of nations. But someday he'll punish us when he's done with us. For he saith, are not my princes altogether kings? Is not Kauno as Carchemish? Is not Hamath as Arpad? Is not Samaria as Damascus? As my hand hath found the kingdoms of the idols, and whose graven images did excel them of Jerusalem and Samaria, shall I not, as I have done unto Samaria and her idols, do so to Jerusalem and her idols? Wherefore it shall come to pass that when the Lord hath performed the whole work upon the mount upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria, and the glory of his high looks. You see, when he's done with the king of Assyria, then he gets punished. 
And that's what's happening to Israel here. When God was done using them, well then, he was done. And he tells them, you back off, or it was going to be his wrath was upon them. Verse 12. Let's see how much I'd like to get through this passage. Oh yeah, it's been an hour. I can get through it. Thank the Lord. Verse 12. Then certain of the heads of the children of Ephraim, Azariah, the son of Johanan, Berechiah, the son of uh, Meshillamoth, and Jehizkiah, the son of Shalom, and Amasa, the son of Hadlai, stood up against them that came from the war. So now all of a sudden, these heads of the children of Ephraim, they've got the message. They got the message from the prophet. The prophet went to the heads of the nation, right? And he says, hey, you guys better back off. And they say, oh, yeah. And then they, so they go to the people and, uh, and they start telling them, hey, we got to back off. Verse 13, and said unto them, ye shall not bring in the captives hither. For whereas we have offended against the Lord already, ye intend to add more to our sins and to our trespass, for our trespass is great, and there is fierce wrath against Israel. So he recognizes that, you know what? The Lord has used us to punish them, but if we go any further, we're going to be adding sin unto our transgression, and then the fierce wrath of the Lord's against us. We've gone far enough. And you know, sometimes the wicked are wiser than the just. These are the wicked. Remember, this is Israel. This is the northern kingdom. These are the idolaters. And yet, they say, you know what? We better stop. Look in uh, Luke chapter 16 and verse 8. Luke 16 and verse 8. It's a sad day whenever the wicked are smarter than the wise. This is that parable of the unjust steward. And it says, And the Lord commanded the unjust steward because he had done wisely for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. They figured it out. All it took was one prophet. How many prophets went to the nation of Judah and rebuked them and pled with them and begged them not to do this? And they didn't listen. They despised all his prophets, we're told. Remember that? Second Chronicles 36. And the Lord brought in the Babylonians. But here's the wicked nation of Israel. For once they're being wise, they got one prophet that comes to them and these guys say, hey, we got to back off. You remember 1 Corinthians 5.1. I'm not going to turn there. But, you know, sometimes the wicked are actually better than the righteous. 1 Corinthians 5.1, it says that there was a man there that had his father's wife. He said he had this, he committed this sin that wasn't even named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Even the Gentiles knew enough that you don't have your father's wife. I mean, they didn't have, a bunch, they didn't have very many scruples, but they at least knew that much. And then you remember the, the, book, the story of Jonah? Jonah chapter 3. In verse 4, this was Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital of um, the nation of Assyria, which was a world empire at one point. And Jonah was sent to Nineveh to tell them to repent because uh, the Lord had enough of their sin. These are heathen people here. These are not Israelites. These are not people that God has any dealings with. But God sent this prophet to tell them to repent. Jonah 3 and verse 4, And Jonah began to enter into the, into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. And the word came, uh, for the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh because, uh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way, and from the, the violence that is in their hands, who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, it says, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. 
Here's a heathen who gets one prophet, one bigoted, racist prophet, because Jonah hated the Gentiles. He didn't even want to go to Nineveh. <laughs> you know why he didn't want to go? He knew that God would have mercy on them if they repented. And he didn't want them to repent. He wanted them to be destroyed. But nevertheless, the king heard that one prophet. He takes off, can you imagine this? He takes off his robe and puts on sackcloth. Can you imagine Donald Trump taking off his suit and putting on sackcloth and repenting for his sins and the sins of the nation? Not a chance. Not a chance. But he did it. And the Lord turned his wrath from him. Sometimes the heathen are more wise than the just. You see, what these men did here in Israel was that they saw the evil, foresaw the evil, and hid themselves. Proverbs 22 and verse 3. Proverbs 22 and verse 3. It says, A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. If they would have decided to disregard what the prophet said and just passed on, they would have been punished. No doubt the Lord would have uh, done something to them, probably destroyed them. But they foresaw the evil. They realized, you know what? We've got some sins of our own here, and the Lord is going to judge us. And they said, give them back. Give the captives back. Give the spoil back. Verse 14, 2 Chronicles 28, 14. So the armed men left the captives and the spoil before the princes and all the congregation. And the men which were expressed by name rose up and took the captives and with the spoil clothed all that were naked among them and arrayed them. So they arrayed them. They gave them clothing because they were naked. Imagine how horrible that would have been to be taken from your country and then you were naked. They took your clothes. You had nothing. There you are destitute and naked. And shod them, so they gave them shoes to wear, and gave them eat and drink, so they fed them, and anointed them. They took care of their medical needs. You remember what um, what the Good Samaritan did there in Luke chapter 10 whenever he found the, the man that had fallen among thieves? He took and poured oil and wine into his wounds. What do you do when you anoint somebody? Pour oil on them, right? They anointed them. I'm assuming that's what this is talking about. They dressed their wounds and carried all the feeble of them upon asses and brought them to Jericho, the city of palm trees, to their brethren. Then they returned to Samaria. They gave them food. They gave them clothing and shoes and medical care and transportation and brought them back to where they had been taken captive from. You think about that. God can restore everything back to us that, we've been, that has been taken away in a judgment if we repent. And they didn't even repent. <laughs> and he restored it all to them. They didn't repent that we know of anyway. You see, that's what God can do. And what these men were doing was basically what the scripture says is to treat your enemies with kindness. Look at Romans chapter 12, 17 through 21. This is a, a good example for us to follow of how you treat your enemies. Any nation that takes prisoners of war and tortures them is a wicked nation. The Vietnamese did it to us, and guess what? We've done it to others. You don't even want to know about all the torture that happened in Iraq and places like that. It is sickening. It would make your stomach turn if you knew what our soldiers and contractors did to people in the Middle East. I won't even tell you what they did. Horrible, horrific things. In CIA torture camps and things like that, it is disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. Romans chapter 12 and verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath... For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Yes, so if you have an enemy, and then maybe this is, you could apply this spiritually, or you could apply it physically. 
If you are a soldier and you take a prisoner of war, you treat him decently, you feed him, you clothe him, you don't torture him. If you are a police officer and you take somebody into custody, you treat him decently, you don't torture him, you don't beat him, you don't do horrible things to him. This is what Israel was doing. It was commendable. I'll give you another example of this. 2 Kings 6, 19-23. I don't know if the U.S. was into the torturing business before 9-11 or not. I know they certainly were after that, and that is a blot on this nation's record. Absolutely disgusting. It was in Vietnam. They did it in Vietnam too? Yeah. Okay. Well, it doesn't surprise me. Yeah. It doesn't surprise me. <clears throat> yeah. Second Kings 6, 19 through 23. Which, if you just think about it, that's just a dumb thing to do anyway, because if you torture the enemy, what do you think's going to happen when they capture you and they found out that you tortured them? Stupid people. Second Kings 6.19 And Elisha said unto them, This is not the way. These men were blinded. They couldn't see where they were going. Um, this is not the way. Neither is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom ye seek. But he led them to Samaria. So he tricked them. And it came to pass when they were come into Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open their eyes, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw and behold, there were in the midst of, they were in the midst of Samaria. That was a surprise. And the king of Israel said unto Elisha, when he saw them, my father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? And he, he answered, Thou shalt not smite them. Wouldest thou smite those whom thou hast, hast taken captive with thy sword and with thy bow? Set bread and water before them, that they may eat and drink, and go to their master. And he prepared great provision for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away. And, when, and they went to their master. So the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel." Now, they could have killed them all. They could have done terrible things to them. They were their enemies. They were the Syrians, remember? But they didn't. They fed them, even fed them bountifully, and sent them back. That's the godly thing to do. Even wise heathens in this world have figured this out. You read Sun Tzu's, the Chinese general, Sun Tzu's Art of War, which was written like, I think it was... I forget how many hundreds of years B.C. It was written a long, long time ago. Even he said, if you capture an enemy, you do not destroy them. When you capture them, you, you, know, you, you stop whenever you've captured them. You don't humiliate them, demoralize them. You don't do that. That's not right. So they end up getting returned uh, to... The, 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 people, the people end up being returned to Judah and, and the, the um, Israelites return to Samaria. Now, I'm just going to go back to 2 Kings chapter 16 and just look at a couple more things. I just want to finish up this verse, basically. 2 Kings 16. So remember in verse 5, after he got done worshiping under green trees, then verse 5, Then Reason, king of Syria, and Pekah, son of Remaliah, king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to war, and they besieged Ahaz, but could not overcome him. And then in verse 6, which we'll get to next week, is, the, is what happens after all this. So between verses 5 and 6 of 2 Kings 16 is that lengthy passage in 2 Chronicles 28 that we just went through. Now we see why they could not overcome him, right? They besieged, they besieged Jerusalem, besieged Ahab, but could not overcome him. This is the best I can figure anyway, given the information here, is that they didn't overcome him because the Lord turned them back. The Lord rebuked them and sent them home. So they weren't ultimately over, 
able to overcome him. And this just tells me one thing. This tells me that God's church can be cast down, but not destroyed. Remember, Judah was God's church. Cast down, but not destroyed. We know that song, and that song actually comes from 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 9. 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 9. Paul says, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. We are all those things. We have trouble, don't we? Don't we all go through trouble? But we're not distressed. We shouldn't be. We shouldn't let it get to the point where we're just so stressed out we can't even function anymore. We're perplexed. Any of you perplexed? I've been perplexed. Last year I've been really perplexed. This is, in, this is crazy, right? But not in despair. I can honestly say that. I'm not in despair. I'm perplexed at all this stuff going on. But I am not in despair. Persecuted but not forsaken. Yeah, we've been persecuted. Churches have been persecuted in this country over the last year. We, we experience personal persecution for things that we believe and things that we practice. But we're not forsaken. God's still with us. God has never left our side. And we're cast down, but not destroyed. Cast down, like in the dumps. Depressed. You ever been cast down? I've been cast down. A lot of people have been cast down, especially this last year. A lot of people have been suffering depression, but not destroyed. We're still here, aren't we? Here we are every Sunday. We're still worshiping God, still praising His name, still going to church. We're cast down, but not destroyed. That's what happened to Ahaz. Cast down, but not destroyed. They were not able to overcome him. Remember what Jesus said? He said, I will, Upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Matthew 16, 18. Satan has tried for millennia to destroy God's church. And now we have the gates of hell assaulting the church again. Literally, the gates of hell. Bill and Melinda Gates are assaulting the church of Jesus Christ. The gates of hell. These people are devils assaulting the church. But guess what? They may try to cast us down, but they're not going to destroy us. No, they're not. And I'll leave you with one last verse. Revelation 20 and verse 9. I wish I could tell you that, I wish I was a post-millennialist and I could just tell you that things are just going to get better and better. The gospel is going to advance and more and more people are going to be converted and Christ is going to come back to a Christianized world. I wish I could tell you that, but I can't. I'm going to tell you that things are going to get worse and worse. Evil men and seducers are going to wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Things are going to get, get worse. Satan, I think, has already been loosed. He's gathering the nations together. He's going to surround his church, God's church, that is. And there, at the end of time, there's going to be maybe one, maybe a bunch of them, I don't know. But there are going to be God's churches that are surrounded by the enemy, by the nations. And just when it seems like all hope is lost, just when it looks like that's it, we're dead, we're done, Jesus Christ comes down and destroys them with fire from heaven. Revelation 20 and verse 9. Let's get verse 8. And shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Just when the devil thought he had finally closed in on the Lord's church, he was finally going to stamp it out and destroy it. The last stronghold of the kingdom of God on this earth, he's got it surrounded and God's saints are looking up and praying and begging God for deliverance. And at the last second, Fire comes down from heaven and destroys them. Cast down but not destroyed. 
So that's where we'll end it for today, and we'll get back to 2 Kings 16, 6 next week, Lord willing.